In this video, we'll be discussing stationary waves formed by sound with the help of a simulation. Sound waves are longitudinal in nature and can form in closed and open tubes. This is a topic that's mentioned explicitly in the OCRA specification, but is also hinted at in other specifications. So it's worth understanding regardless of which exam board you're doing. To follow this video, you need to have a basic understanding of stationary waves. So you may want to check out our introductory video first. Here you can see a tube with its left end closed and its right end open. This is known as a closed tube. Imagine that there's a speaker to the right of the tube emitting progressive sound waves of a particular pitch or frequency which travel into the tube. These waves then reflect off the closed left end and travel back to the right with the same frequency and wavelength as the incoming waves. As a result, the two sets of waves superpose with each other. Since these waves are of just the right frequency, the result of this superposition is that a stationary wave develops inside the tube. We can understand this better with the help of a nice simulation. Here, you can see these blue circles representing air molecules oscillating inside this closed tube. What we're seeing here is a stationary wave pattern. If you look at the left end of the tube, you'll notice that the blue circles are not moving, meaning that the left end is the position of a node. Remember, a node is a point on a stationary wave of zero displacement at all times, just as the displacement position graph below is showing over here at the origin. Notice the N here, which stands for node. As we move away from the left end to the right, we see that the circles are oscillating in phase with each other at a certain frequency and that their amplitude gradually increases as the graph shows. This black curve here and its reflection down here represent the amplitude of a particular particle of air at a certain position along the tube, while this moving red curve shows how the displacement of that particular particle changes over the course of time. We see that the particles at the right end of the tube are oscillating with maximum amplitude. In other words, there's an anti-node at the open or right end of the tube. Notice the A here, which stands for anti-node. This stationary wave pattern is called the first harmonic. If the speaker were to emit sound waves at three times this original frequency, a new stationary wave forms, the third harmonic. As before, we can see a node at the closed left end and an anti-node at the right open end. This is true for all stationary waves that form in such tubes. A node forms at the closed end and an anti-node is present at the open end. But we also see now an extra antinode, a node, compared to previously. The fifth harmonic will form at five times the frequency of the first. The seventh harmonic forms at seven times the frequency of the first, and so on. Notice how every higher harmonic has an extra node and antinode compared to the previous one. Before we look at some maths, let me just point out that you'll often see these displacement position graphs down here in discussions of this topic. And it's easy to think that they represent a transverse stationary wave, such as those that form on a string. Remember, we're dealing with sound waves here, which are longitudinal. These graphs just show how the displacement of the air molecules change as you go along the tube we can figure out the frequencies at which stationary waves can form. Let's call the length of the tube L. We know the distance from a node to antinode corresponds to a quarter of a wavelength, meaning that lambda, the wavelength, is equal to 4L. Using the wave equation, V equals F lambda, where V is the speed of the sound waves, we get that the frequency of this first harmonic, F1, is equal to V over 4L. If we look at the next harmonic, we see that three quarter wavelengths now fit into the length L, meaning that lambda is equal to 4L over 3. Using the wave equation again, 
we find that the frequency of this harmonic, the third, is equal to 3v over 4l, which is equal to 3 times the frequency of the first harmonic. Similarly, the next possible harmonics are the fifth and the seventh, which form at frequencies equal to 5 times and 7 times the frequency of the first harmonic. Notice that only odd numbered harmonics can form in the system. This is because the stationary wave patterns that can exist here must have a node at the closed left end and an anti-node at the open right end of the tube. Another way of putting this is that an odd number of quarter wavelengths must fit into the length of the tube. For example, in the fifth harmonic here, we can see that five quarter wavelengths must fit into this length L. In general, the nth harmonic, where n is an odd whole number or integer, forms at n times the frequency of the first harmonic. So Fn here represents the frequency of the nth harmonic. Notice that these frequencies are inversely proportional to the length of the tube L, meaning that as L increases, these harmonic frequencies decrease proportionally. So this explains why blowing air over or into a longer tube results in a lower pitch sound than if you were to blow air into or over a shorter tube. Interestingly, stationary waves can also develop inside tubes with both ends open, what are known as open tubes. You might be surprised that sound waves can reflect from the left open end, but it's true, and you can learn why with a bit of research. Let's go back to the simulation to see what goes on here. In an open tube, antinodes exist at both ends. Here, the first harmonic has a node at the center of the tube. The next harmonic is the second. Its frequency is twice the first harmonic frequency. There's now an antinode at the center and nodes a quarter and three quarters of the way along the tube. The third harmonic looks like this, while the fourth harmonic looks like this. Notice that all possible stationary waves have antinodes at both ends. The way to understand these patterns is as follows. The distance from one antinode to the next, its neighboring antinode that is, is half a wavelength. And the possible stationary wave patterns that form here consist of a whole number of these half wavelengths fitting into the length of the tube. So for example, for this fourth harmonic here, we can fit in one, two, three, four half wavelengths into the length of the tube. For the fifth harmonic, we'd be able to fit in five half wavelengths into the tube and so on. Also note that in contrast to a closed tube, both odd and even harmonics are possible in an open tube. I'll leave it to you as an exercise to prove that the nth harmonic frequency, where n is any odd or even whole number, is equal to n times the first harmonic frequency, which is itself equal to v over 2l. If you follow the reasoning earlier for a closed tube, you should be able to derive this. These expressions are in fact identical to those describing the harmonics of a vibrating string fixed at both ends, as you can see in our introductory video that I mentioned at the start. The physics of stationary sound waves in tubes forms the basis of understanding the sound produced by wind instruments, such as flutes, saxophones, didgeridoos, and so on. I've left some links in the description if you'd like to learn more about this. Let me just say that I'm grateful to Walter Fent for letting me use his excellent simulation in this video. And that's also where I got a number of the images from. I've left a link to the simulation uh, in the description. So I highly recommend you check that out and the other excellent simulations on their site. If you found this video useful, please like it, share it, subscribe to the Forest Learn channel if you haven't already, and leave a comment if you have any questions or suggestions. Thank you for listening. Take care, and I hope to see you soon.